he, he mentioned this tribe, and i um, just glad to be here in the midst. I consider y'all my tribe. Um, I'm a double dipper, but uh, y'all my tribe. <laughs> You're my people. <laughs> so um, but I'm also really glad um, something's been going on at my house. I'm really glad my toilet flushes and it doesn't run all the time. Really glad I could do a happy dance over that. Um, been working on that. I did it. I've re- I've replaced everything in the tank. I can name it. Yeah. Yeah. So if you your toilet runs all the time, it could be your flapper. Could be your could be your fill valve. I I replace either one. Just let me know. Yeah. Yeah. I've been powered by uh, YouTube. That's where I got my degree from. Is YouTube. Uh, just a little uh, hiccup with it, and my son finished it off, and so, um, yeah, it's awesome. I'm very glad. <laughs> that has nothing to do with the rules of engagement. <laughs> so, here we go. Um, Stephen said, come practice with this thing, and I said, no, I'm going to go pray with my friends instead. And so, <laughs> it's going to... This is... Um, According to Britannica, I had no idea there was still a Britannica. I, I thought when the books went out and the internet came on that Britannica was done, but they are holding strong, okay? You can look on the internet, still find Britannica. And um, so I looked up the definition, really what the rules of engagement, what does that really mean? Um, it refers to the orders issued by a competent military authority that delineates when, where, how, and against whom military force may be used. So it tells you who your enemy is. It tells you who your enemy is not. And they have implications for what actions soldiers may take on their own authority. So sometimes you can do your own thing. Probably not very often. And what directives may be issued by a commanding officer. Rules of engagement are part of a general recognition that procedures and standards are essential to the conduct and effectiveness of civilized warfare. I never thought of warfare being civilized, but I guess that's where rules of engagement come in. So let's just jump right into it. Rule one, stand your ground. You can't run away from the enemy. Well, well actually, you really can away from that. But let me say it this way. Let me say it nicely. Let's don't do that. Okay. When you run away from the enemy, it's actually a lack of faith. Okay. In Isaiah 52, 12, it says, For the Lord will go before you, and God of Israel will be your rear guard. That's why you can stand your ground. You're not going alone, but you're protected on all sides. We have to trust that this promise is true, okay? In my daughter-in-law's book, she has a book out that's called Heaven in My Home, and Jerry Ann says that faith has a sound, okay? In warfare, it's the sound of our own voices as we declare the goodness of God and the faithfulness of him to go before us and be our rear guard. It's us saying, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to trust in you anyway. It's reminding ourselves that we are more than conquerors and that nothing by any means shall harm us. I was praying this afternoon about this, and this section came to my mind. And what God was saying to us is, um, when you get involved in things in your life, okay, when you get mad at somebody, when you get your feelings hurt, when you get anxious about something or any number of things that rise up in you that are either flesh-based or from the enemy, either one. Okay? God says, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you in those situations. I'm waiting on you to say what I say. I'm waiting on you to... Um, stand against the enemy. 
I'm waiting on you to tell him where to go. I'm waiting on you to say what is true because if you do not say it, I cannot activate the angels in your behalf. So I'm waiting on your word so that I can perform that word in your life. So when we have those things to come against us, okay, know that God wants to help, but you've got to speak. Faith has a sound, and you've got to speak what God says. If God says it, it's true, and he will perform his word. Okay. I'll go a little bit further and say that faith has motion. There are some times when you got to do something. It's not enough to say to somebody, hope you're going to be okay. Hope you make it to the next paycheck. Sometimes you got to go over, you got to lay hands on them. You got to cast demons out. You got to speak blessings over them. You got to pray over them. Sometimes maybe you have to give somebody some groceries or a check so they can make it to the next week. Okay. Sometimes you have to go and tell somebody, I forgive you. So sometimes just speaking isn't enough. Sometimes you have to go and do. But that's a part of standing your ground. Because when you do those things, when you say those things, when you act according to what God tells you, you're standing your ground against the enemy. You're not letting him get past you. You're saying, this is what I'm saying. This is what I stand on. And all of heaven and angel armies are backing me up. Okay. Second one, steward truth well. Let's look at an incident in the Bible where the truth of God was not handled well. And it starts in um, Genesis 2.16. It says, God commanded the man, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. Because I'm pretty plain to me. I'll have to interpret that. <laughs> I think I got it. Um, especially, <laughs> wrote this down, especially if God spoke in the Message Bible version, because that's what that is, and it's, it's pretty plain. Um, but know that when God says something, it is truth. And it behooves us to give attention to that truth and to handle it rightly. And to keep in mind, this was told to Adam from God, before Eve was even on the scene. So let's look at how it got repeated when we uh, pick up with the next, uh, the next rule is, I should have told you, don't put a picture of a snake on here. But you did, so okay. I know, yeah, it's okay. I'm free, I'm free. <laughs> I'm healed of snakes, so I've healed of snakes. I will not fear. It's just a picture. Um... But the, rule, the, the third rule is eyes focused on your commander. Now, we're a little further into the snake in the garden story with pretty, little, innocent, brand new to the earth with a donated rib, Eve. And it comes out of Genesis 3, verse 1. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman. Now, right here is where she should have picked up her towel and her sunscreen, and she should have headed back to the double wide and say, I'm not talking to no serpent, okay? You just don't do that. If you're listening to the enemy, then you're not focused on your commander. You can't concentrate and give your full attention to either one. This is when you become tossed back and forth. Okay, when it talks about uh, by any wind of doctrine, it's because of who you listen to. Okay, make up your mind what kingdom you're in, and that determines your commander and who you listen to. Okay, 
So anytime you listen to a serpent or the enemy, it's going to turn out badly. Spoiler alert, you didn't know, it's going to turn out badly. Okay? So let's continue with verse 1. He spoke to the woman, Do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? He sounds so innocent, doesn't he? And concerned, and I really want to learn, you know? Help me so that I know what God's talking about. Even his question is a lie. I had never thought of it before until I was looking at this, but I believe the whole time that God has been talking with Adam, the serpent was somewhere in the background listening. And I know good and well that he heard this and heard it exactly and precisely. But a part of the questioning is not to find out information. This is heard when I doubled it. It is to get you to question the word of God. He's not trying to help you out. He's starting to set the hook. So don't be fooled by feigned interest in your circumstances because he's not. Satan used to live in the presence of God, and he was called Lucifer, which meant light bringer or shining one. He knew, he knew how the kingdom of God operated, that it was based on love, and that every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, that's what the kingdom of God is based on, because he lived up there, okay? And every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is truth. So when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven, still full of evil, I mean, that didn't straighten him up. That didn't go, he didn't go like, oh, you know, I messed up. Well, maybe if I'm good enough down here, I'll get back up there. He's been trying to set up his own kingdom ever since. But it can't be like God's kingdom because there's only one true and living God. And it's based on truth. If there were two kingdoms like that, we'd be confused, okay? So in Satan's kingdom, he makes his words sound like God's truth, but they're just a tad off. And tainted truth, even a fraction of a degree off from dead center, is a lie. And even if you leave out, if you tell all the truth, but you leave out part of the truth, that's a lie as well. However ill-advised, Eve sets out to help the serpent with his incorrect information. Rule number four, don't chat with demons. Genesis 3, 2 through 3 now, the woman says to the serpent, Oh, not at all. We can eat from the trees in the garden. It's only about the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, don't eat from it, don't even touch it, or you'll die. Remember, just a fraction off of a degree, off of dead center, is a lie, even if part of the statement is true. God didn't say not to touch the fruit. I believe she could have picked the fruit, shined it up, taken it back to her double wide, put it on a table in her dining room. Nothing would happen to her as long as she didn't need it. Somehow, though, communication broke down between when God told Adam the rule about the tree and when Eve decided to tell the serpent about the, about the rule. So instead of guarding that truth from the serpent that was privy only to her and Adam, she spilled her guts. She should have answered his question with none of your beeswax. But poor little innocent, brand new to the earth, with a donated rib, Eve played right into the clever hands of the serpent. I think by her answer, the serpent now knew that Eve, at least, didn't know about Adam, but at least Eve was capable of distorting truth. And so that made her an easier target for his kingdom. So the serpent started reeling her in. 
and basically said, girl, you know that's not true. You know, you know the thing about him is he's just wanting to be the big dog. He don't want anybody else to be like him. And if you eat that fruit, girl, how can fruit be that powerful? Make you die. That's ridiculous. Don't believe that stuff. Come on, girl, look at that fruit. You know you want it. And how awesome would it be to know what God knows? I believe at that moment and during that conversation, whether it ever had been before or not, Eve's flesh was aroused and awakened. Because when you start listening to the enemy, your flesh kicks in. Okay? All right, let's stop right here. During those walks in the cool of the day when God used to walk with Adam and he'd call and he'd say, you know, where are you? I remember Don Francisco had a, story, had a song like that. It was awesome. It just sounded so, well, I hate to use the word magical, but it sounded magical. And, and peaceful and just, wow, you're walking, you know, with the God that created everything. Is it possible at some time that in one of those walks, God might have said, oh, by the way, y'all and me, we're alike. We, the Holy Trinity, made y'all just like us. That's pretty cool, huh? Well, maybe he didn't really say that, or else maybe Eve just forgot. So the serpent was actually promising Eve everything that she already had, everything that she already was, the image of God and in his likeness. And I think why he did it is that he was jealous of Adam and Eve for being what he could never be and what he tried to be and failed at. You know, when somebody gets a blessing that you wanted all along and you don't get it, you kind of want to knock them down some, don't you? I'll just steal that blessing from you or at least ruin it for you. So I, that's what I think was going on there, as I think jealousy on his part. But instead of our pretty little Eve with the donated ribs saying, you silly snake, I'm already like God. What else you got? <laughs> she reached for the forbidden fruit. And she took a bite, and then she handed it to Adam. Honey, you just got to taste this fruit. You won't believe it. It's amazing. And almost the instant that they both ate some, they both started looking at each other in ways they never had before. And they decided, we need to cover up our glory. The sad thing is, they were ashamed. What God had created in them, wild and free, that was Adam and Eve to start off with. And there was nothing shameful about it. There was nothing embarrassing. There was nothing horrible about it or oopsies or don't tell your mama about. It was the way he intended for it to be. Okay? But all of a sudden, that knowledge ruined it all. It ruined the freedom. I heard something interesting a few weeks ago in a sermon Eve believed, you know, because of what she told the serpent, Eve believed that if I even touch that fruit, I'll die. And I wondered, where did she get that from? I wondered, was it Adam so, you know, afraid that she was going to say something, you know, touch the fruit, that he said to her, you better eat that fruit, and you better not even touch it. You know, I don't know if that's where it came from. It's possible, but she believed that because that's what she said. I think if I touch it, I'll even die. So when she touched that fruit, picked it off the tree, nothing happened. Don't you think at that time that she thought, hey, I touched it, and I'm still alive, I'm still breathing. I bet if I eat it, nothing will happen. I'll bet God was messing with me. I'll bet he was just, what went through her mind? Was there doubt and unbelief that entered in then of God's word even being true? And this is, back to rule two, steward the truth well. 
know exactly what God said. And don't, you know, it says, is it revelation? Don't add a jot or a tittle to it. Okay? Because when we do, we're easily deceived then. And you know what's so mean about this conversation with Eve? It's the very reason that Lucifer got thrown out of heaven. He was trying to be like God. And so he's done the same thing to her. Got her to eat that fruit. He said, I got kicked out of heaven. I'm going to get you kicked out of something. And it worked. Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden. Number five, your commander is smarter than the enemy. We'd be a mess if he wasn't, you know. Sometimes I think we think that the enemy is smarter, but in 1 Corinthians, the first part says, the temptations in your life are no different from others' experiences. It also says in 1 Peter that your family of believers all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering that you are. He's not original. He's only got a few, a handful of things that he messes with people with, okay? But what he does is he kind of tweaks each one because your situation might be a little different from my situation. It's the same thing. We both might be dealing with fear, but it might be something a little bit different. But when you go to Kim, fear is fear, and she's going to cast that out of you. It doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> So when we think that our problem is unique, then we start doubting whether God's going to take care of my problem or not. Okay, well, he might have fixed your problem, but he might have had your daughter get pregnant, but, you know, I've been infertile for 25 years, and I still don't have a baby. I, I don't know. I've, my problem is different. When he starts making you feel excluded from everybody else, he separates you from the pack, and then you no longer can believe the truth. I didn't finish that. Whoopsies. I'm just going, see, should have practiced, but no, I had to do something else. The rest of the verse says, this is where he's come in smarter than the enemy. But God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. You know, I thought of uh, the story of Esther. And they had an edict against them that all the Jews were to be destroyed. And so what did God do? But through his wisdom and through his idea, he says, but you can do this. I will, um, or they wrote a, an edict that said, but you can fight against your enemies. They didn't have that before. Before, they were just going to be slaughtered. But God gave them a way of escape. He says, you can fight for yourself. And that's what they did, and they were victorious. So God always has a way of escape. Just because the enemy brings something against you does not mean you're stuck in that and that's what your life's going to be like. There's always a way of escape. And usually it's something that the enemy didn't plan on. He sure didn't plan. He planned on the cross. But I don't think he planned on the resurrection. And I don't think he planned on Jesus' trip down to hell and everything that he shook up down there either. So, God's smarter. Okay, now let's go. Rule six, don't shoot your allies. This is out of Proverbs 18. This is pretty, pretty, um, pretty simple. Words kill. Words gives life. So that means one or the other. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. This rule is actually based on a scientific experiment carried out initially by a Japanese researcher that proves that this proverb is true. And you see the, um, the two jars there. When he carried out the experiment, this guy actually had three jars because it was his thought 
that positive thinking and positive energy can change your environment, can change things. Actually, what he was proving, that it changes water. Okay? So he took three jars, and he put cooked rice in them. And he, he also put within the three jars of cooked rice um, pure water. Okay? And um, one of the jars said, thank you. The other jar said, I hate you. And the other jar didn't say anything on it. So every day, he would go by the jars. And the one that said, thank you, he would just praise that jar of rice. Thank you. You're just so special. I'm just so glad you're here. Just all kinds of, of nice and loving and encouraging words. The other one, he would actually even sound angry, the one that had hate on it, I hate you. And he would say mean things, I hate you, I wish you weren't here. And the third one, he totally ignored. So what happened at the end of the experiment was the one that he spoke love and appreciation to, uh, the rice was fine. The water in it was fine. The one that he said hate to, it got kind of moldy and yuck looking. But it said that the one that fared the worst was the one that was totally ignored. Now I have seen now this uh, these two pictures that are here. Uh, there have been a lot of teachers and a lot of people who have replicated this. You can Google it and watch as many videos of this as you want. Uh, but this was some teacher did this. She only did two jars: one that says "love you" and one that says "I don't know, hate you" or something like that. And just those two jars. Uh, were enough to make an impact on your class, on her class, because she heard the kids just making fun of each other and being mean and stuff like that. So she decided she was going to change the atmosphere in her classroom. Where I even got this from was from my son, Matt. Um, he played baseball in high school and a little bit in college, and every time he got the opportunity, he played baseball. Uh, he has a son that's, uh, Garrison's, I think, nine, and he's playing baseball. And so last year, uh, the league asked uh, Matt, would you coach his baseball team? Matt says, um, okay, I've never coached before, but okay. And so um, Matt had no idea what to do. He'd played it, but he'd never coached it. And so um, They'd lost some games, and when they, the kids, when one would do something, the kids would, man, that's terrible. You're like the worst player. You know, you missed that ball. You shouldn't have missed that. And they just yay in each other. So somewhere along the way, Matt had found this experiment, and he found that very picture. So he printed it out on an 8 half by 11 sheet and took it to practice the next day. And he hung it up in the dugout, and he told them the story about the experiment with rice. And um, he says, I don't want you talking to each other like that again. He said, we are the best team, and each one of you is the best player. You're best at your position. And so he said one time he had a little boy on his team, and uh, the ball came to him, went right through his legs. And he was acting all disappointment, you know, kind of banging his glove against his leg and stuff like that, just acting disappointed. Matt hollered out at him. He says, who's the best second player? And that little kid said, I am. And it turned him around for the rest of the game. Well, Matt had never coached before. It was his first year. They'd lost a game or two to start off with. But when the season was over, they won the championship. And it was, they had, he had parents coming up to him thanking him for telling that story because they wanted to use that in their family because it had made such an impact and such a difference with the team. So speak life over your allies don't shoot them with negative words. Your family, your coworkers, your church groups, your hairdresser, whoever is important in your life and you want them to, to succeed, anyone you want to give life to, it's important the words you speak over them. Rule number seven, be strong and alert. You had to know that was going to be in there. And this is uh, Ephesians 6.10. I just got a few verses that um, talk about being strong and, and being alert. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him. 
that strength which his boundless might provides. You don't have to show up with your own strength. He's going to provide it. The next one is 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in your faith. Your conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things. Keeping the trust and holy fervor born of faith and a part of it. Act like men and be courageous. Grow in strength. And also, being courageous doesn't mean that you don't feel fear. Being courageous is in the face of fear. You do the right thing. You do the good thing. You do the God thing. And this is out of First Peter. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times for that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. We don't know right now what the enemy's going to try to hit you with. But no, he's roaming. He's looking. Same thing happened with um, in the book of Esther. The Jews didn't know at the time that what was being planned for them with Hamas and all of his shenanigans. So the enemy was already working, and they didn't know it. So you have to be vigilant. You have to always be watching, keeping your eyes on your commander, but always be noticing what's going on around you. Withstand him. Be firm in faith against his onslaught. And this even goes back to the first one. The first rule of stand your ground. Rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined. Knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brotherhood, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. You know, when you put on the armor that's in Ephesians 6, one of the things is you put on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace. And when I would put that on in the morning, I would say, um, I stand in peace. I bring peace wherever I go. All confusion and chaos leaves. And then one day, I looked something up about the shoes of preparation of the gospel of peace. And I realized that a part of that, maybe all that it means, maybe part, is that in the face of the enemy, you stand. You are immovable. Their shoes that they put on had like cleats or spikes on the bottom so that they could stand immovable. Okay? And you're standing immovable in peace in front of your enemy because you know who goes before you and who goes behind you. Rule eight. Be courageous. This is out of Deuteronomy. Be strong. Take courage. Don't be intimidated. Don't give them a second thought because God, your God, is striding ahead of you. He's right there with you. He won't let you down. He won't leave you. That's a heck of a promise. I mean, that gives you confidence. That gives you strength. We got to believe it. We got to say it. We got to know it. This is out of Psalm. Here's what I've learned through it all. Don't give up. Don't be impatient. Be entwined as one with the Lord. Be brave and courageous and never lose hope. Yes, keep on waiting for he will never disappoint you. And the last one also out of Psalm. Be brave. Be strong. Don't give up. Expect God to get here soon. And in the New Testament, it says that God will show up just at the right time, right when you need him. Nine, don't swap armor with your buddies. David found this out. This is, uh, comes out of 1 Samuel 17. Then Saul clothed David with his armor 
He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword about his armor, over his armor. Then he tried to go, but could not, for was not used to it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I'm not used to them. And David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, his lunch bag, a whole kid's skin slung from his shoulder. In his pouch and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. Because of fear, Saul was ready to give up his personal armor to somebody else to do anything, something to get rid of Goliath. How did he think? You know, it, it describes Saul when he was um, first, uh, they were in the Bible when it was first talking about him going to be a king. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else. It's kind of like if, if there was a, a big group and uh, Saul was in the middle, he'd be the, he'd be the direction post. You know, I'm looking for somebody that's two people over from that tall guy. You know, you could pinpoint him. Why did he think that would even fit David? But that shows you what fear can do. It can make you panic and do things that make no sense and things that will not help in a battle. But David was smarter because the God in him is smarter. And so he knew to take that stuff off, the stuff that didn't fit him, and get what God had used with him before. God has each of us to fight our battles, a lot of us in different ways. And, and that's, our, uh, that's our coat of armor that he's put upon us. That's our witness. And you can't trade witnesses and testimonies with somebody else. It has to be what God has worked through you. And only that is going to work to fight your battles. The last one, every battle isn't your battle to fight. So about a week or 10 days ago, I found out that one of my grandchildren was being bullied may still even be to this day. Not only in school, you know, kids picking at the clothes he wears and the boots he wears and, you know, just making fun of him. And then even on the uh, team that he's on after school, um, just a couple of guys just picking at him and making life hard. When I found that out, you heard of a mama bear? Nan's going to learn there's a grandmama bear. You don't mess with her either. All those ten rules, I didn't even consider them. I, I wavered between being mad and being hurt. I don't like you to hurt my grandkids. Because I know what words do, right? They turn rice black. So in my mind, I was going through scenarios. I was going through lectures. I was going through what I wanted to tell them. I was going through, your parents know you're bullies? I think they need to know you're bullies. And every time I'd come up with a, Something I wanted to say to them, even the coach, you know, I, I thought about going to the coach. How, how can you have a good team when you got kids that are bullying each other? Every time I'd come up with a lecture or I'd come up with something like that, I'd say, okay, no, that doesn't sound like God. Okay, let me come up with another one. <laughs> Seriously. I kept trying to, okay, let me bring it down a little bit. That's, that's harsh. I understand that. For two days, 
I would get up in the morning, and the first thing I'd think of is what I want to say to those guys. What I want to say that would change their life, or what I want to say to them that would shame them for what they're doing. I didn't think about standing your ground, handling the truth well, because my grandkids was at stake. And honestly, I wasn't willing to wait for God's process. You know how he peels the onion a little bit at a time? I didn't have time for no onion. I was ready for action. I never said anything to anybody. I didn't even talk to my daughter about it. But after a couple of days of that, I um, went to church where I double dip. <laughs> And um, they go there too. My kids go there. And somebody came up, and a little bit older, um, young adult, to my grandchild and said, hey, I hear you've been bullied at, at school. He said, let me tell you what to do. And he had stuff written down for him, suggestions, what to pray, what to say. It didn't come from his grandma. <laughs> came from somebody else, came from somebody else that didn't love him like I love him. I missed my opportunity to pour into him at that time. So that was a wake-up call. And so what I had to do in my mind is, you know, I didn't want him to get hurt any more than he already was. And I knew if this kept on and kept on, I mean, they could have a fight. I didn't want that. I didn't want one blow to hit him. I finally had to come to the place. I said, okay, God, I, I give up. I give him back to you. I give him the problem. I give you those other people. I can't control them. See, I want to control them. I find that a lot with the grandparent. I want to control, and I can't because they don't live with me. <laughs> so you kind of go through this thing in your mind. So I realized, okay, God, I'm, I'm giving you control. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray that you will heal the wounds in his heart. And I'm going to pray that you put a shield around his heart, that things, those darts would quit hitting his heart. And I'm going to pray for those other kids too. That um, first, that you would touch my grandchild that he would see you work in his heart, in his feelings, in his attitudes, that he would see that the God that's in him can handle anything that they throw at him. I prayed for him first. And then I prayed for the other kids. I, I didn't pray, God, change them first. Tell them to stop it. Because that wouldn't be right. <laughs> I said, God, help them to see you. Help them to know you. Help them to see that that doesn't make a team. I can't tell you the end of the story. I don't know what's happened. But all I know is uh, Mama, Grandma Bear <laughs> settled down, and I truly did get into the heart of God. I had moved God off the throne, said, you might want to scooch over a little bit. I got some work to do. <laughs> He's fine with that because he won't do anything. <laughs> It just lets you wear out. So it took me two days to go, okay, I probably don't have a good plan. So whatever battle that you're in the middle of right now, just know that the words that we sing, we sang it again tonight, you're fighting a battle he's already won. Jesus defeated every enemy 
when he was crucified, it says in second in Colossians 2.15, he stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their shame, their sham authority at the cross. Their authority was a sham. And he marched them naked through the streets. And that naked is not the same naked that it was in the garden. This is a naked that's full of shame and bitterness and sin and evil. The reason he's already won those battles, he's gone before, took them all at the cross. All we got to do is find that path. Find that path where he fought that battle. Every single one, every single one of the battles that all of us fight, every single one has already been fought, has already been won, and we just got to walk in that path. All of the pretenses, all the deceit, all the false authority, all the bravado of everything that rails against you was removed at the cross. They've lost their authority to torture us. But we have to make sure that we don't give them the power anymore. There you have it. So let me just pray. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, would you make real in each of our hearts what's already been done? Every battle that's been won. And it was one Jesus with every stripe that you took on your back, every time they kicked you, hit you, shoved a crown of thorns on your head, every time blood spewed everywhere, Jesus, you were fighting our battles. Cement that in our hearts that our battles have been won. God, for each person here that's fighting a battle, I ask you to reveal truth to them. Truth of who the enemy is. Help them to see the strategy of the enemy, where it keeps leading them, what emotions are involved in it. God, show them the way of escape. Show them the words, God, that open the door that say, hey, come this way. Get out of that battle. You don't have to fight it a second time. Help us to know, that God, that you are a good, good father. That you won't let your kids get beat up if they'll look to you. God, help us to see when we've told you, scooch over, I got this. Because I declare to you, God, that my plans are not my pl your plans. My ways are not your ways. I cannot imagine or think of the ways to get me out of the messes that I get in. God, tonight, would you come with Holy Spirit, wash over each one of us, Jesus, with your blood, Everything that's not of you, everything that's believed a lie, everything that's in us that has caused us to look aside, everything that keeps us from seeing truth, Jesus, wash over us and cleanse us. Help us to see the shoes that we have on that are able to stand with peace in front of the enemy.
thank you, God. You've given us everything that we need. We lack nothing. We praise you, O oh Lord God, for who you are. Keep telling us who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen.